on and my pilgrimage to the Holy Land because that's what they called it that I went on. And I'd like to share some parts of it with you, but I'd like to begin with a prayer. And this is a prayer for the mission of the church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Everlasting, ever living God, whose will it is that all should come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, inspire our witness to him, that all may know the power of his forgiveness and the hope of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Um, so this is... This is the Holy Land, and I'll get back to this map in a little bit more detail. You'll be seeing a lot of maps throughout this, uh, through my slides, because I get very confused when I'm in a country, you know, like, where am I going, where was I, and where... I had a great app, by the way, on my phone. You guys should get it whenever you travel, because you don't need the internet to use it. And it's called uh, maps.me. And it was great because I could be in the bus and I could just click it and it, it just runs off of the, the what, satellite GPS and satellite, but you don't need internet. And it's, do you know this one? No, I don't. It's so cool. No, yeah, it's yeah. Great. Awesome. <laughs> anyway, I love you. So, you'll, so anyway, let me get started. So this is important, at least for me and what I want to say. Uh, there's three types of journeys that we often go on when we travel. And this is from Dean Michael Kimmon, who is the Dean of the Cathedral in St. Louis, Missouri. And I found it very helpful. He said, sometimes when we travel, we go as tour tourists. We go on the journey mainly to consume goods, services, and experiences. I went to Ireland a year or two ago. That was me. I did a lot of consuming, let me tell you. And it was fabulous. And sometimes I like to go as a tourist. Sometimes you go as missionaries. We go on the journey to affect change to make the place we are visiting better. Done that with our youth group and stuff. And he says, then sometimes you go on a pilgrimage where we go on the journey to be changed. And so my journey was about me being changed and being open to what I experienced there, the people and the places. And they definitely did change me. So my pilgrimage to the Holy Land, I kind of divided these slides up and I'm going to start really cranking through them. Places in the life of Jesus that I found interesting that I thought maybe you might find interesting. And then the Episcopal Church and its mission in the Holy Land. And then just a brief side trip to Petra. I just have to show you one or two slides of that because that, that's an incredible place. You could do, I'm looking at you, Klaus, you could show a lot of slides at that place. So, um, what happened is I flew in here to Tel Aviv and then went to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, I spent time in Bethlehem, back to Jerusalem. Then I went into Jericho, then up the Jordan Valley, to Nazareth, around Lake Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, right in here. And then back through more part of the West Bank, through Nablus, and back to Bethlehem, and to I mean, to Jerusalem. So let me cover, that took me many days, but here we go. So this is where I stayed, if you want to know, this is St. George's Cathedral, it's the Episcopal Anglican Cathedral there in the Holy Land. It's <clears throat> located in East Jerusalem, and I'll talk more about that later. I stayed in a very nice little guest house right here, um, and that is also the diocesan offices of the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem, and I'll talk about that at the end. That's my group. Uh, that's, uh, I had to scan that picture because I didn't have a photo of uh, Slide, a camera picture of it. Some of you may know Mark Stanger. Mark worked at uh, Grace Cathedral for many years. He's one of the priests there, a really great guy, canon presenter. This is Ian Kumari. He was our guide. He's just a terrific guy. He is a Palestinian Christian. This is his church. He is a member at St. George's Cathedral. And uh, some of you, I didn't know these people. This is Marie Smithhausen and Dick Smithhausen. They're from Pleasant Hill. Who knew there would be people on my trip from Pleasant Hill? <laughs> I never knew that. Anyway, that's me right there. Okay. So one of the things I want to start out is uh, this kind of an understanding of Jerusalem a little bit. This is Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. And uh, I think these landmarks will become familiar to you soon. Here is Gethsemane. This is the Mount of Olives. And this is the temple area, the temple mount. This is at the time of Jesus, so there is the Jewish temple there. That's gone now. And this right here is the western wall. You're going to see that in modern, or the old city Jerusalem, which is really modern Jerusalem, 
All this area down here is like underground somewhere. And those walls now extend all around like this. Another important thing to remember is the Fortress Antonio. That's probably where Jesus was tried, although some say, no, nope, he was tried here at the Palace of Herod. I love going to the Holy Land because no one can say for sure that anything happened right in that spot. <laughs> and as he had said, he says, Bruce, places in the Holy Land, holy places, they move. <laughs> you know, so, it, but it's, it's, it's still really fun. That's a view of the, uh, Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. Uh, so again, temple. This is the uh, garden, the Mount of Olives Garden of Gethsemane over here. This is the Kidron Valley, the Gihon Valley. The Antonia Fortress right here, important to remember. The site where Jesus was crucified, we think. That's important because now it's all enclosed in the city. And that took me a while to figure out. Here's the city today. This would be where the temple was. This is now where the Dome of the Rock is. Uh, that commemorates uh, Muhammad going on his night vision journey. And uh, this is the western wall, the last part of the old temple wall. This would have been where that Antonian fortress is. And this, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, now covers the site where Jesus was crucified and buried. Does that make sense? It did make sense to me when I first got there and they took me there and I, I go, it's a big church. Well, what you'll find out is that in the third century, in the, the Byzantine church, they just built churches over any site that they thought had anything to do with Jesus. So that's what happened. Uh, there it is, Ariel. So that, again, this is the Mount of Olives, Garden of Gethsemane, just to kind of orient you. And where I stayed was right up in here. I stayed in East Jerusalem, and I would always come into the city this way. Actually, if you go back, I'd always come in through the Damascus Gate or Herod's Gate, and I did. I hope you saw this. It's the Muslim quarter, Christian quarter, Armenian, and the Jewish quarter. They divide it all up. It looks kind of complex and confusing, and it is. So now let me try to simplify it for you. This is a demographic map of Jerusalem. This is what we were looking at. That is the old city. That's where I was staying right up there. You can see this part is the Jewish side, and anything yellow is the Palestinians. We'll talk more about how that's <coughs> So there's several layers I found out to most places you go to. The first, first century Roman layer, which we're really interested in, and almost every time you go to look for that, it's 16 feet below where you're standing. So you don't get, what they did is they just get building and building and building upon layer. Just wherever. bring it in. Yeah, they didn't have bulldozers, they just built on top of stuff. <laughs> then there was the 4th century and 5th century, this is a Byzantine church. Remember Constantine converted to Christianity, his mother Helena as well, and Helena went on a roll, and she's the one that built, had all these churches built over all these unbelievable sites. And then the 7th century came along, the Persians kind of knocked them down, then the Crusaders came along, they built some up. So you're always looking at a jumble of, you never know quite what you're looking at, but it's interesting anyway. So, the first part I want to share, here is Jerusalem, and just a couple miles away is Bethlehem, the place where we are told that Jesus was born. And uh, that's just on the outside of one of the churches there. What I want to show you, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. When dark is the world today, this child brings the world to light. So, that's it, folks. That is the Church of the Nativity, built by Helena, and it's the oldest church in Christendom. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is kind of interesting. Notice this tiny little, to go through that door, you have to bend over like that. And they, people would say, oh, you had to do that because when you go into the place where Jesus was born, you should be bowing down. Well, I don't think that's it. You can see, at one time it was bigger yeah. here, and at one time it was really big. <laughs> so the story I got is they built it that way because people would come in and keep taking stuff with their big horses and their carts, so they made it harder to get into, so you couldn't take as much stuff out. So there you go. When you get in... It's always under construction. They're tearing up the floor. It's a magnificent structure. 
but right under this whole area, it's, remember what I said, it was built over sites, so this is what it was built over, and that's where they believe Jesus was born. And this is a, a side kind of cave area underneath it, just to give you a sense, because what I'm going to show you next is this chaos, because, well not chaos, there was about 50 of us in this small little room for a Eucharist, we were yet lucky, this is my little group there, that, and right back here is where they think Jesus was born, and I'll show you that too. But we uh, went in with a group of Franciscan priests, and they invited us to be a part of their Eucharist, and it was very lonely. So we had communion right there. And this, they say, if you put your hand down here and touch, that's where Jesus was born. I want you to know that any time they told me I could touch something, I dove in there and touched it. I touched everything in the Holy Land. <laughs> but here's what I wanted to share with you. One of the things I've been thinking about is when it says in the scripture there was no room at the end, it's a translation of this uh, Greek word kabaluma, which can also mean room. It can also mean lodging. In fact, later in Luke's gospel, Luke uses that same word, kataluma, to refer to the room where Jesus and his disciples met one time. So, it's led many, many scholars to think that we often think of Jesus being born out, you know, in a barn or whatever. No, it was probably more of a cave-like setting. And when it said there's no room at the room, it meant there was no room in the main living room, so you had to walk through it to the back room where they would keep the animals at night. And I'll show you some pictures of what that might have looked like. This is um, one of the more unfortunate things about the Holy Land. This is the large wall that's been built around most of Bethlehem by the Israelis. Uh, and I'll talk more of that, about that at the end, about their need for security and why. Uh, there's the wall. It, Supposedly, and it does divide is the Israelis from the Palestinians. It also keeps the Palestinians from the Palestinians. Keeps them from their olive trees and everything else. So it's a very difficult situation. Um, I just wanted to share this real quickly. This is Shepherd's Field, uh, which is right in Bethlehem, supposedly where the shepherds, you know, were told by the angel, I don't particularly like this picture, so I put that in. <laughs> But right here, right next to Shepherd's Field, is one of these homes that I talked about. There really, there were a lot of homes just built into the sides of uh, the hills, and that's where people lived. And this would have been the main living area. This was an entrance, main living area. And then back over here would have been that area where at night they kept the animals. And perhaps that was the area where Jesus was born. Um, I had to show you this. I came out of that thing at Shepherd's Field. Those are sheep, and there's a shepherd. I go, I can't believe it. Not <laughs> Send for me in the Holy Land. Uh, it's a sign of some kind. Then I want to share about traveling from, I went back into Jerusalem. I spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. But then I traveled down here to Jericho, up the Jordan Valley, to Nazareth, right there and uh, then to the Sea of Galilee. So this is the first thing you notice. There's a lot of different geography there. Uh, th it's very Mediterranean around um, uh, Jerusalem and that whole uh, Samaria and Judea. You start heading down to the uh, Dead Sea and talk about a wilderness, that's it. And I love looking at this because I figured, who knows where Jesus was born and all these other things, but Jesus had to look at this country and he had to travel through this country. So I, I just thought it was awesome. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. This is a monastery. Can you see that built into the side of this mountain? There it is. And I hiked down there and went to that monastery, and that's the uh, St. George's Monastery, 5th century. And it's supposedly this is a place where the prophet Elijah was in a cave. It's pretty cool. I hiked up in there and looked in the cave. I don't know. You could touch the rock. I touched it. <laughs> You'll see all the places I touch, folks. <laughs> uh, there's Elijah. Hello, Elijah. They had great icons in there. Great place. I show you this because this is a trail right in front of that monastery. And it's a trail that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho. Anybody remember a story about a man was on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho? And he fell among 
They got beat up. Yeah, this could have been the same area. And you can see how hostile that environment is. Great. Okay, this is the Dead Sea. Yes, I did go in it. Yes, I did float in it. And I put mud all over my body, but I'm not showing you pictures of it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so Jericho, perhaps some of you know this, is one of the oldest inhabited cities in the world. A few people have been living there continuously for 11,000 years. So everything is underneath. But this is, I wanted you to see this. You're going in, this is part of the West Bank. When you go into this area, this is what you read. This road leads to Area A under the, under the Palestinian Authority. The entrance for Israeli citizens is forbidden. Dangerous to your lives and is against the Israeli law. So, my friends, you should just know, this is how the West Bank is kind of carved up. Uh, any of these little hash mark things, that's Area A. That means it's totally under... Uh, the uh, administration and the military security of Palestinian Authority. The green areas are Palestinian administered, but the security is Israeli. The Area C is all Israeli controlled military administered. So, you go through here, so Jericho, back to Jericho, another cool place here folks, this is the Mount of Temptation. I'll show you a view. This is, so imagine that right down here is, is Jericho. I'll show you the picture. Uh, sixth century. Now you're looking down on Jericho. I didn't have to hike up to that one. I took a cable car. It was terrific. <laughs> I loved it. Note the difference out here. This is really, really tropical. They grow bananas and dates and everything down here. It's, it's very, it's, it's gorgeous and very nice. So that's the monastery there. That's my friend Mark Stanger, Mount of Temptation. Supposedly Jesus was tempted by Satan there, casting him out. What do you think that is? It's a rock on, what Jesus, on which Jesus supposedly stood when he was tempted. Guess who touched it? <laughs> I touched it again. Uh, moving along, just to show you how much that area is down there in the Jordan Valley. Where does they bring in water there, or does it come from natural springs? Or yeah, pretty much, they've got the Jordan River there. The big That's a great question. The big source of water is the Sea of Galilee, and everybody fights over it. Everybody fights over it. And the Israelis have control over it. Lots of desalinization, right? Uh, I don't know what they do it in this area. I mean, maybe out on the coast, and I can talk a little bit about that. I love the gospel. They couldn't have been better for this. This is Nazareth. <laughs> can anything come good come out of Nazareth? Well, Kathy will tell you about that. It was maybe 250 people at the time of Jesus. It truly was a backwater town. I mean, backwater is an understatement. It was a blank. Who knew? Nothing. Uh, here's another thing that I love. This is the Greek church, the Greek Orthodox Church at the Annunciation, supposedly where Mary was told that she would be the mother of the child of God, Jesus. And so there's this beautiful mosaic here. And I love the mosaic, the, the art inside this, and I've got to show you one of my favorites. <laughs> Joseph carrying Jesus. I thought that is so cool. That just made sense to me. That's what he would have done with this kid. And also another one of my insights is that we very much we often think of Joseph as a carpenter. He may have been, but the word that's used to describe him is tekton. That's a Greek word, tekton. What does that sound like? Tekton, architect, tekton. It means simply builder. And my hunch is, I think he was a stone builder. Because you'll see that they were very close to Sepphoris, which was a big Greek city that was being built. And my hunch is, he may have done some carpentry, but I think he was a stone builder too. Okay, then, that's Mary's well. Supposedly, according to the Greek Orthodox, it was at this well that the angel came to her and told her she was going to be a mom. Now, this is the Roman Catholic Church of the Annunciation. They said, no, it didn't happen up there up the street. It happened here. And so we find it. Where was it? I don't know. Uh, this is, what's really cool about this is this, which is first century dwellings. 
and some say it was the home of Mary, and they built a church over it. That's what you do, build churches over holy sites. Uh, this is where I stayed. I just wanted to show you this real quick thing that with the Sisters of Nazareth, a Roman Catholic group. It was really nice. This is where we stayed. But under here, it's fascinating because they unearthed first century dwellings down there. Who knows? Maybe these were Jesus' neighbors that lived down here. But here's the best part. <coughs> what does that look like? <laughs> See, it's a manger. It's a double manger. A feeding trough. So there was probably something like this that the scripture tells us Jesus was placed in. But this was a double one. I thought must have been pretty rich people. <laughs> anyway. Did you then, touch it? Pardon me? Did you touch it? Heck yeah. <laughs> uh, they didn't tell me I couldn't. I, I did. So here's Nazareth. This is Sepphoris that I was mentioning to you. This is a, a big, big Greek city. And probably would have employed people from Nazareth to help work at it. So that's why some people think that Joseph, Tecton, Builder, might have worked here with Jesus. Here's what I want to show you. From Nazareth, you need to go down through these mountains to get to the Sea of Galilee. And this is where Jesus' ministry was, most of his ministry here in Capernaum, his new home. And again, what struck me is, is the countryside. I don't know if those were the places where Mary heard that uh, Jesus was going to be her son. I know Jesus had to walk through country like this. That hasn't changed that much in 2,000 years. And I'll just, this is the Sea of Galilee. It's big. It's really big. And it's the main water supply for that whole area. The Jordan River. Uh, this is uh, Bishop Michael Ingham. He was on our tour, on our pilgrimage. And uh, he's a retired bishop from the Anglican Church in Canada, a really great guy. So we all renewed our baptismal vows there in the Jordan River. And I had to follow him in Jordan, <laughs> so there I am following him. Uh, this is the Mount of the Beatitudes, supposedly. I just like the picture out there. You can see this. I'm going to show you this again. This is back where Nazareth is. And Jesus had to come down that valley a few months to get to the Sea of Galilee. So I know he had to look at these things. And that's, I love the land more than the actual places. Um, the sea, see there's that mountain, this is Mount Harbaugh, and he had to come right down that valley. I have tons of pictures of the Sea of Galilee, it was one of my favorite places. Here, I just took a picture of this rock because it said it's called the Gospel Trail. This is down in Capernaum, Nazareth, he had to go down through here. There's that Mount Harbaugh, that big thing he saw, and to Capernaum. Capernaum. I don't know why they spell it that way. The town of Jesus. I show you this because this, they believe, is a, about a 7th century synagogue that would have been built upon, because they built always built on top of things, the synagogue that Jesus went, attended. It's underneath here somewhere. And right next to it over here is a home that they have uh, unearthed that they believe is the home of Peter. So what would, do you think they would do if they found something like that? Build a, Build a church over it. Yeah, I've got tons of those pictures too, but they did that. So, then I traveled back, I was, came back to Nazareth, spent some more time there, and then I began traveling through the West Bank here to Nablus, and then to a little town called Tabe. This is Nablus, and I love this about the Greek Orthodox Church. If they don't know the name of the saint, they'll make it up. We, this is about Saint Fokin is the Samaritan woman at the well. In the scripture, she has no name. But they say, ah, she's got to have a name. Fokin, that's her name. <laughs> All right, moving along. There she, there's Jean. This is one of the many paintings, and I want to show you how remarkable it is. But here's that story. So he came to Samaria, uh, the Samaritan city called Sekar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon, and a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So Jacob's well. I'm going to show you a picture of that. What do you think I did there? Touched it. Touched it, and I also poured water on myself. From the well. Some people drank it. I wasn't that full. <laughs> uh, this is the inside of that large church. It's spectacular. And this man here, Father Justinian, is one of the most remarkable guys I know. 
he has done almost all of the painting in that church. And he has suffered dearly. Uh, it's been his mission since he's been a young Greek Orthodox priest. Um, the other priest he was working with there at one time was attacked and killed and, uh, by Jewish settlers, and he was stabbed nine times and left for dead. But he's the most loving, caring, compassionate guy you'd ever want to meet. And that's his artwork, all up there. And that is Jacob's well. I touched it, and I took water. It's really deep, and I took water from it. And like I said, some people drank. I wasn't that bold. I put it all over me. I thought that would have thought that worked. Okay, so here we were back in this area called Jacob's Well. This is all, this is the, the whole Samaria. This is Judea down here. And then I traveled from there to my Taipei. Again, another one of my favorite places. Journey up there, see how the, what the land looks like? These are all olive trees, olive trees all over the places up there. Beautiful. And this is Tibet. Tibet is the only 100% Christian town in the Palestinian Authority. In 1948, the Holy Land was 20% Christian. Today, it is 2%. And shrinking. Anyway, Tibet, 100% Christian town. And this was uh, the Church of St. George. It was born, built in the 4th century by Constantine and Helena. It was, it was a remarkable place. We ran into our guide. Uh, <clears throat> Iyad, his uncle, was up there saying his prayers. Iyad is from this town, Tibet. Iyad is the, my, the guide I showed you. Okay. All right. Ready for another one of my favorite things about Tibet? They have a brewery. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this group. This I, I'm so in awe of these people. Uh, by the way, uh, Christians are probably the only ones really interested in alcohol and Israelis, but the Israelis won't drink Palestinian no. beer. But these are very entrepreneurial people. They are now exporting their beer to Germany and other parts of Europe. They use their exporting licenses to help the small uh, olive farmers to bottle their oil and export it. They're a terrific group of people. One of the women whose husband runs it, or is a, the whole family runs it, and she's married to him. She's from Chicago. She's a, a Greek Orthodox that married this Palestinian man. Anyway, very entrepreneur, very fun people. And I'm not kidding, the beer is really, really good. <laughs> oh yeah, there's my today that I, I hear. <laughs> All right, moving along quickly. Uh, back to Jerusalem from, does that make sense? Just traveling again from now south. Back in Jerusalem. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. Huge church built there with the garden. This is the Mount of Olives. This is a Russian Orthodox church built to commemorate Mary Magdalene. I did not go there. But we started our Palm Sunday walk. Uh, we decided we'd walk that way that Jesus would take from the little town of Bethphaga. Sometimes people say Bethphage or Bethphage. They say Bethphaga. Bethphaga, house of figs. Oh, Bethlehem, house of... Who took that uppity women of the Bible class? Remember Bethlehem? What was that? House of... Bread. Bread, yes. All right. A little knowledge there. Uh, okay. <laughs> So we started out in a little chapel in Bethphaga, and I just wanted to show you that I knew can sing. Excuse me? Bethphaga. <laughs> Churches, we had uh, two church musicians. That's why mm -hmm. they just made us. Uh, mm -hmm. That's acoustic. And so then we went to Bethphaga. We traveled all the way down, and we were going to this whole area, eventually right here, and that would be where we would start the walk or the way of the cross, the Via Dolorosa. 
stopping along the way in places like the Garden of Gethsemane, lots of old, old olive trees, beautiful. There it is, the city, the old, what they call Old Jerusalem, but it doesn't look really like it did at the time of Jesus, but some parts remain, and I want to show you one. These are first century steps to the old city. Uh, according to the people I was talking to, these are steps that very likely Jesus and his disciples would have walked up to enter into Jerusalem. And if I can go back a slide, that would have been over, way over on this side, over here. So, here's an ancient part of the city. This is, you've probably heard of this, the Western Wall, or Wailing Wall, mm -hmm. where faithful Jews come to say their prayers. Uh, they say their prayers there because this is really probably the only significant remnant of what was the temple, Jewish temple that was up here. And so they say their prayers there. I went and said my prayers there. I put little slips of paper in the wall, cracks in the wall, for Church of the Resurrection. I just put Church of the Resurrection in June to June. I touched it, so... <laughs> Uh, then, uh, this is, uh, again, the Western Wall. This is the men-only side. This is the women-only side. Really? Really. Huh. Not everybody's happy about that. I can tell you that. But then there's a ramp over here that leads up to what they call the Temple Mount or uh, Haram al-Sharif, as the Arab friends would call it. And this is uh, what you have to read when you go through. According to Torah law, entering the Temple Mount area is strictly forbidden due to the holiness of the site. That's for any Israeli. And yet, they will go up there. And they will go up here in the sacred area to Muslims, and the reasons the rabbi don't want you going up there is they say they don't know exactly where the temple really was, and they don't want you walking on something so holy. But Jews will come up here, and they're not supposed to come up here and pray, and they will. And that really upsets people. In fact, the people I talked to said the next Antifada would probably have come <coughs> here. That's a very contentious Thing. So it's People, contentious inside the Israeli community. Some say don't go up, and others very <clears throat> extreme. There's extremists on both sides. There's extremists on the Palestinian side, extremists on the Israeli side, and some of those extremists on the Israeli side say, no, we want to take this over, level it, and build a new temple. <laughs> so it's difficult. And by the way, this Temple Mount area is really under the control of the King of Jordan. We can talk a little bit about that later. But here, the picture here, imagine though, this was the temple, the Jewish temple. Over here is the Antonia Fortress, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which we would travel to on our, we did the uh, uh, Way of the Cross walk through there to there. Uh, that's just part of what we started out. Um, this next picture is, one of the things you see everywhere is Israeli authority, uh, military presence. They're everywhere. And they provide the security there. But you just get used to it. And people said, because I was there when there was a, there was a lot of trouble. People, uh, a Palestinian man killed a couple people with his car. Um, I never personally felt threatened by anybody. I felt, I felt I could just go around, I just need to have my wits about me. And I was in East Jerusalem the whole time, the uh, Palestinian side. I felt very comfortable with it. So, uh, walking the way of the cross, I back to this uh, <coughs> slide I showed you, which uh, this is uh, <coughs> Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. So this would have been the temple. This is the Antonia Fortress where they believe Jesus was tried, his trial. And then we walk kind of through the old city on this path to get to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, also known as Church of the Resurrection. It's our church, folks. In fact, a lot of people just call it Church of the Resurrection. There. And that's 
Church of the Resurrection or Holy Sepulchre. Now, this is what made sense to me. This is what a, this is not the Western Wall I showed you. Just think of it as a Western Wall of the city at the time of Jesus. This is what it would have looked like in Jesus' time. Calvary was outside the wall, and say they say this was the tomb of Jesus. So what they did when they built the church, when Helena built it, they just built it right over this area and excavated this out. And they built another little tomb over the spot. Does that make sense? Is that helpful to you? Yeah. Yeah. What I'm showing? Because it was very confusing to me. This is part of the basilica today. At the time of Helena, it went way out here, but it's been cut down. So we all come in. I came in this way through the entrance here. Then immediately up these stairs to touch the rock. Of, well, see the rock of Calvary. And yes, I did touch it. <laughs> so I came in through this gate. Hard right up the stairs, and you can bend, kneel down and touch, supposedly, Calvary. And I touched it. Then I went back down. This is the tomb of, or built over the side of Jesus' tomb, also the side of the resurrection. Uh, I was fortunate that I was there really, really early in the morning with our group, maybe six in the morning, and there weren't very many people around. Usually it looks like this. This is a mass of humanity. And you can go in there, and you can touch it. And I did that. <laughs> I weaseled my way in there. Okay, I don't really fly here. So, mission of the Episcopal Church of the Holy Land. This is Archbishop Suhail Dewani, lovely man. Uh, this is Bishop Michael Leon, and one of our other tour leaders right here. And so, this is his whole area. He's in Jerusalem, but he's in charge of Israel, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. He's got a big, big area to cover. Um, this, and I'll, this leads to what I'm going to talk about, their mission. This was the, how this part of the world was divided up in 1947. The yellow is the Arab state, Palestinian state, and the orange is the Jewish state. Um, this is what it looked like in 1949 there was a war, and this then became part of Israel, all this area through here, and now this yellow area, the West Bank, really is under control of Israel too. It's a difficult, difficult situation. What happened after that 1967 war, and this was pointed out to me by one of our Jewish speakers, he said, all of a sudden, Israel found itself in control of this area that they had. What's Samaria and Judea? That's their ancient kingdom. That's the kingdom of Israel right here. Where they were living all along here, Tel Aviv, who lived there? The Philistines. So when they came here, man, it was like coming home when they found that they went to the 67 war. So, as you may or may not expect, ever since that time, there have been settlements throughout the West Bank. All these little blue dots are Israeli settlements. The Palestinian ones are, the, are areas of this darker color like Jericho, Nablus, Ramallah, down here, Hebron. And then uh, the lighter green is joint authority, and the really light green is totally controlled by Israelis. You have a question here. Yeah. 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 So are the blue dots the ones that um, are in the news about that they're establishing and the Palestinians are so against it? Yeah. So, um, I got this sort of take on things from one of our Jewish speakers, and he pointed out that Israel is basically obsessed with peace and security, and let me tell you, they need to be. They really do. They're surrounded by. It's a difficult situation they're in. I guess you're going to hear from me, and here's my take. I believe that uh, the Jews need to have a state. And I think Israel is the place, but I also believe that the Palestinian people need to have a state. And they well, really need to have a 
stay. There's a bit of a <coughs> between peace and security because yeah. they're not really So anyway, together. it's concerned with three actors, the Palestinians, their neighboring countries, Jordan, Egypt, Syria, and Lebanon, they have treaties or with Jordan and Egypt, mm -hmm. you know, these guys, and other countries, especially Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. Israel is politically diverse, but the right is very much in control, according to our speaker. And this is a said, like I pointed out, that after 67, they found themselves in control of Judea and Samaria, and it was like, gosh, it's just too tempting. So, this is what he said. This is an Israeli speaking. He said, the way for peace is for the state of Israel to not be coterminous with Israel as described in Hebrew scripture or Jewish history, and each side, Israel and Palestine, has to commit to addressing its own extremes. Our national problem is often exported on religious vectors. He doesn't think that's good at all. He said, with peace, everybody wins, and he believes it's possible. So, just briefly, the mission of the Episcopal Church in the Holy Land. This is uh, Bishop, uh, Archbishop Suhail Dewani saying, this is our mission, healing and education. That's what the church focuses on. They have many hospitals. This is one right outside uh, of Jerusalem. Actually, it's in East Jerusalem. It's the Princess Basma Center for Disabled Children. And we went there and visited. And it's really cool. They, just, they take anybody. Uh, Christian, Arab, they don't care. And uh, they also focus on schools. This is the Arab Evangelical Episcopal School. It is in Ramallah. And I just wanted to show you, it, this is only like 30 seconds of uh, singing. But this is, when I went there, they had a, a little celebration, graduation, where there are these high school kids. Get out. 
And finally, just a quick, and this will end, I think, in a good way. Uh, so I was here in Jerusalem. I journeyed across the Alamby Bridge into Amman, and Amman down to Petra. You can just show a slide. This place just took my breath. <coughs> Look at this. Oh. It just, it, it, I, I can't, I, this is doing it in injustice. It's just so incredible to go there. You need to go. Well, or look at my, all my slides. Um, that was a small group that went into, uh, there were just a few of us that went, and that was very exciting. And here's what was interesting to me. This is kind of a, I didn't know this was going to happen. We went back, we went back to, from Petra, back to Amman, and we were headed to the Alamey Bridge, and our guide said, let's stop at Mount Nebo. Does anybody remember Mount Nebo from the Bible? That is Mount Nebo. And you're looking out at the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. Let me just read this. Then Moses went, this is from Deuteronomy, then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pishkai, which is opposite Jericho. Remember Jericho? You, well, you can see that. Uh, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead, as far as Dan, all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the western sea, the Negev, and the plain that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as the Lord. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see, your, see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Mm -hmm. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. And so this is what I thought about, this is what I want to end up. I had no idea I was going to get this view, and you're looking out, and this is all what, we call it the what kind of land, the promised land, right? And he couldn't get to it. But our Israeli speaker, this is what he said, he said, I think our only hope is when we begin to see the promised land, not as the promised land, but as the land of promise. Mm -hmm. It's not promised to anybody, mm -hmm. but it can be a place of promise. So, what's it going to be? The promised land or a land of promise? So that's what I got. I'm sorry, that's a lot. But